name is Saha Chan. Today we will present an analysis which is entitled Compare and Contrast the Respective Approaches of the English and Malaysian Law of Contract towards the rest as a mediating factor. This presentation will be presented by myself, Kunjit Kaur Anak Rampuat Manjit Singh, Stephanie Ranji Kiyama, Muhammad Izzat Farhan Bain Mohizan, Muhammad Nabil Qasim, and lastly, Muhammad Gamal Al Prafai. Here is a presentation outlined as followed. I will start with the introduction. Nabil will follow with the comparisons between the English and Malaysian legal system. Izan and Stephanie will then present on the differences between the English and Malaysian legal system, while Gamma will conclude and provide criticisms on both systems as well as recommendations to improve the systems, and finally, an opinion on which system is the better. And lastly, we will also show a list of the references that we have used throughout the presentation. In order to provide an in-depth analysis of our topic which we are discussing today, I will first begin with an introduction of the concept of duress. I will first provide a background information on the concept of duress. According to Tritel 13th edition, the consent of a contracting party by some form of pressure which the law regards as improper. The victim of such pressure may be entitled to relief under the common law rules of duress and under the equitable rules of undue influence. Duress is a means by which a person or a party can be released from a contract where that person or party has been forced to coerce into the contract. If this coercion can be shown to be true, then the contract entered into is not considered as valid agreement. There appears to be two elements to a duress claim which has been set out which is followed by assessment. In a typical pressure case, there are two distinct grounds upon which the impugned contract may be invalidated, one plaintiff base and the other defendant base. One reason for not enforcing the agreement is that the person seeking enforcement is seeking to enforce an obligation by his wrongdoing. A second reason that can be seen is the person denying the contract's validity did not consent to the specific contract. I will now then continue with the effects of duress. The innocent party may choose firstly either to affirm which is continued with the contract or rescind which is terminate or set aside and bind the contract. When sued on the contract, the person may also set up the duress as a defence. I will now proceed with a short analysis on the English common law duress. There are three types of duress at common law. The first is duress to the person. This may consist of actual violence to the claimant or to members of the family or threats of such violence. Duress to goods is the threat of damage to the victim's goods rather than his to his person. The case of Skid vs. Bill held that the unlawful detention of one's goods does not constitute duress. However, in Ivia Lab, Law Gov stated that the limitation in Skid vs. Bill is that not only duress to the person when entitled a part to avoid a contract has been discarded. Therefore, it is obviously clear that duress to goods can, in an appropriate case, form the basis of a claim for relief. I will now then continue with the concept of economic duress. This type of duress arises where one party uses his superior economic power in an illegitimate way to coerce the other contracting party to agree to a particular set of terms according to his specifications. The economic duress occurs when the other party is stuck as there are no other practical options but to agree to the new terms of the contract as specified. I will then move on with the elements that are required to be fulfilled. An ongoing contract must exist between you and the party. The other party has threatened to cancel the contract and you accepted the new terms to the contract because you were under duress and there were no other available alternatives. I will now then proceed with the Malaysian legal system. Coercion. The law on coercion in Malaysia is provided in Section 15 of the Contracts Act. Section 1, Section 15 defines coercion as the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by the penal code or the unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person whatever with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement. I will then proceed with the concept of economic duress in Malaysia. Since the recognition in the Sibian and Sibetar, the doctrine of economic duress has developed. 
It is applicable in commercial transactions where a party attempts to modify the contract's terms and threatens to discontinue unless he is paid more than originally agreed. However, in the case of Perlis Plantation Berhad v. Muhammad Abdullah Ang, V.C. George stated that our contract act does not provide for any form of coercion other than as defined by Section 15. Later, authorities then appear to recognize the doctrine of economic duress in principle, although on the facts, economic duress was not established. Coercion under Section 73 in the Contracts Act. Section 3 provides a person to whom money has been paid or anything delivered by mistake or under coercion must repay or return it. Section 73 is a restitutory provision allowing a person who has paid money or delivered something, whether by mistake or coercion, the right to claim restoration of the money paid or item delivered. Um, I'll then move on to Nabil, who will then show the similarities of the English and Malaysian legal systems on their approaches to duress. Now, I'll be examining the similarities between the English and Malaysian legal approach to duress. The first similarity is the effect of duress and the requirement of free consent. If consent is given, but it is not given freely, although the contract would come into existence, it would be rendered voidable at the option of the innocent party. This is where the innocent party can wish to continue with the contract or rescind it, which would make the contract void. This principle is seen in the obiter of the English case of Atlantic Baron 1979, where Justice Makota stated that if there has been such a form of duress leading to a contract, that contract is a voidable one. Similarly, the principle is illustrated in the Malaysian Contracts Act of 1950 under Section 19, Subsection 1, where it says consent to an agreement is caused by coercion, fraud, or misrepresentation. The agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was, co was so caused. This can be seen in the English case of Barton and Armstrong, where the defendant threatened to kill the plaintiff if he did not sign a deed, agreeing to repay a loan, and to buy shares in the defendant's company. Here, the courts found the contract voidable, voidable for pressure that the law does not regard as legitimate. On the Malaysian law, we can refer back to the Contracts Act of 1950, Section 50, where coercion is defined as the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden in the Penal Code. The Penal Code does cover a variety of offences, such as hurt and wrongful resistance, as well as confinement. Furthermore, both the systems of law acknowledge the principle of causation. This is where the victim must show the link between the alleged duress and his or her entry into the contract. For this point, we can refer back to Armstrong and, and Baron and Armstrong, where the claimant had to establish the casual link between the threat to his life and his spouse and him entering into the contract. In this case, Lord Wilberforce stated that the victim not only showed, had to show the illegitimate means of persuasion, but subsequently needed to establish a relationship between the illegitimate means used and the action taken. This same point can be reflected uh, upon in the Contracts Act of 1950, Section 15, where the coercion is defined as a committing threatening to commit in any act that is forbidden in the Penal Code, unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person, whatever, with the intention of causing any person to enter into an agreement. This shows that even in the Malaysian law, the act or threat needs to cause an action in, the, in entering into the contract to be classified as duress. Next, we'll be looking at the link of duress to goods. In both systems of law, it is recognized that if money has been paid under a voidable contract for duress of goods, it is recoverable. The English law approach is seen in the case of Aisley and Reynolds, 1731, where the plaintiff pawned goods with the defendant, and the defendant refused, to re refused repossession of the goods of the plaintiff and was made to pay an extra interest charge in order to redeem his own goods. The plaintiff sought recovery for the extra paid and argued that the contract pursuant to the payments was voidable and successfully recovered the money. Similarly, Section 73 of the Contracts Act of 1950 provides a provision where any money has been paid or anything de delivered by mistake or under coercion must repay or return it. Here it is important to note that Section 73 coercion is interpreted in, a general, in, in its general and ordinary meaning, resulting in a wider interpretation compared to the coercion defined in Section 15 of the Contracts Act. A Malaysian case to illustrate the point of money paid under avoidable contract is recoverable, we can turn to the case of Chin, Chin Nam B Development and Thai Kim Chu, where the plaintiff signed a sale and purchase agreement. 
which the defendant threatened to cancel if he does not pay an extra 4,000 ringgit. The plaintiff paid and subsequently sought recovery under Section 73, which was successful. The final similarity we will be looking at is the remedy for duress available in for both Malaysian and English system. There exist three forms of remedies available, which are recession, restitution, and duress as a defense. Firstly, the equitable remedy of recession is available, where the innocent party can choose to continue or set aside an avoidable contract. This is seen in the case of Adam Opel GM, GmbH and Mitras Automotive UK. The defendant, a van parts supplier, threatened to terminate supply contract with the claimant, a van manufacturer, if the claimant did not pay extra. The claimant protested but paid the amount and subsequently sought recovery for, for what he had lost. And it was held that the claimant was entitled to rescind the varied contract as the contract was voidable for economic duress. The same remedy of recession is available in the Malaysian law under section 19 subsection 1 when consent is when consent on agreements is caused by coercion, fraud or misrepresentation, the agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was, was so caused. Here again it is important to note that although the remedy available in both the both systems, there exist certain situations where the right to rescind might be lost in both the Malaysian and English legal systems. These general bars of recession are 1. The affirmation of contract by the innocent party. 2. A bona fide purchaser acquiring the matter before the recession. 3. There is a delay between the knowledge of a vitiating factor and the action to rescind it. And finally, where restitution in integrum is not possible. The second remedy that is available is restitution. This is where the courts try to return the parties back to their original positions. In the English case of Universal Senatorial, Lord Diplock stated that the remedy to which economic duress gives rise to is not an action for damages, but an action of restitution of property or money ex exacted under such duress and avoidance. Similarly, the remedy of restitution is available in the Malaysian law under Section 66 of the Contracts Act 1950, where an agreement is discovered to be void. Or when, an, or when a contract becomes void, any person who has received any advantage under the agreement or contract is bound to restore it or to make compensation for it to the person from he, whom he received it. Section 66 therefore acts as a restitution provision where the benefits received are returned and compens compensation is made if necessary. The third and final remedy available in both the systems is duress as a defense when sued on the contract. The innocent party can opt not to take any action and rely on defense of duress if litigation arises. The English case on point is the case of BNS contact contracts and Victor Green publications, where the claimant informed the defendant that the work being done under an existing contract could not continue as he had no more funds to pay for his workers. When the defendant offered to lend some money, the claimant refused and explained clearly that unless the workers get paid, the claimant would not fulfill the contract. The defendant paid the wages and deducted it from the contract payable to the, to the claimant. When the claimant brought the claim, the court recognized that there was no practical alternative for the defendant and that economic duress was existent and therefore the deductions were not recoverable. The same point of defense of duress was addressed by Justice Lo Hock Bing in the case of OCBC Securities and Ko, he, Ko Ki Kuat where he stated that the defense of duress or economic duress must be such so as to mitigate the free consent in order to render the contract void. Now having examined the similarities of the two approaches, Izad will proceed to illustrate the difference between the Malaysian and English approaches to duress. Now we will be going through the difference, uh, differences between the English and the Malaysian legal systems. Now first things first. Coercion is provided under the Malaysian legal system under sec uh, in Section 15 of the Malaysian Contracts Act, and it is uh, notable that it is not the same as duress under common law. Section 15 is wider in that it covers the unlawful detention of property. Common law of duress, however, only recognizes actual or threatened violence to persons and threats to a property were held to be insufficient to amount to duress. Now, there are two approaches to the concept of duress. The first will be the overborn will theory, and the second will be the illegitimate pressure theory. The overborn will theory was practiced in both England and Malaysia. However, in modern times, English courts are moving away from it in favor of illegitimate pressure theory. Today, overborn will theory is primarily followed by Malaysian courts and not English courts. 
in under overborn will theory, the focus is given to the consent of the will of the victim and steps are taken to objectively see whether or not the individual had indeed consented to the contract. Now, under illegitimate pressure, this approach questions whether or not the pressure applied to an individual was legitimate or not. If the pressure is legitimate, as in the case of R versus the Attorney General of England and Wales in 2003, where it concerned the case of an SAS soldier who was forced to sign a confidentiality agreement between him and the Ministry of Defence. In this case, it tells us that the nature of the demand has to be questioned. Thus, it can be said that the Privy Council has established a two-stage test for illegitimate pressure. The first issue was whether or not the threat was legitimate in the eyes of the law, whether it was legal to give the threat. Secondly, the justification behind the threat must have been adequate. If, for example, the threat was to for, was for unjust enrichment, the, the justification was inadequate and thus it can be seen that, the, that there was indeed pressure, uh, illegitimate pressure applied. Now, what constitutes as illegitimate? The case of DSDN sub C LTD versus Petroleum Geoservices, ASA, in 2000, has laid out what the courts would consider whether the pressure was illegitimate or not. This includes actual or threatened breach of contract, whether the accused had acted in good faith, good faith or not, whether there were practical alternatives, presence of protest, and if the individual had indeed affirmed and sought to rely on the contract. Thus, try, thus crimes and thoughts are completely regarded as illegitimate. An unlawful goal as, will also be illegitimate as per the Universal Sentinel and the and with the obiter in R versus Attorney General. The courts have stated that the more serious the impropriety and the greater the moral obliquity which attaches the, to the conduct, the more likely the pressure is to be seen as illegitimate as seen in the prog uh, progress bulk carriers and the tube city. Now, the next thing will be economic duress. Malaysia appears, appears to affirm all three types of duress while not expressly recognizing economic duress. The case of OCBC Securities Malacca, SDNBHD, and Kohi P. White in 2004, the judgment delivered, uh, delivered stated that our courts have been slow to import the concept of duress as defined under Section 15, or to import the concept of economic duress, unless there is positive evidence to that effect, which must satisfy the guidelines given by the Privy Council in the case of Pao On. Thus, it would appear that once a case that would feature the facts, but uh, we would feature facts that would uh, satisfy the English principles of economic duress. Malaysia would indeed adopt economic duress through case law, if not through legislation. However, it must also be noted that these judgments were delivered from the High Court. It is unknown what the Higher Court, such as the Court of Appeal or the Federal Court, would make of this, of this uh, judgment. Now, remedies. Remedies is a form of court enforcement of a legal right resulting from a successful civil lawsuit. Damages are monetary compensation for the plaintiff's losses, injury or pain while coercive measures require a party to do or omit using a specific act through injunctive relief. In the English legal system, the English party is entitled to have the contract set aside for operative duress. The victim may rescind the contract and may also choose to raise duress as a defence. However, if a victim rescinds, the right to rescind is lost forever. However, in the Malaysian legal system, under Section 65 of the Malaysian Contracts Act 1950, the other party is excused from further performance and the rescinding party will restore any benefits received under the voidable contract. The effect of rescission under Section 66 of the Contracts Act 1950 is that the contract becomes void and the party receiving any advantage must restore any advantages received or if in the case where that is not possible, make a compensation for it. My colleague Steph will go on to clarify Malaysia's approach to duress. We will now move on to look at more distinctions of duress between the common law system and Malaysia. We'll start off with Malaysia. Now, it's already been established that in Malaysia, duress under Section 15 governs a wider range of issues as opposed to duress in the common law. However, Hussein makes a notable distinction between the two jurisdictions, which is that of prejudice can be made to any person. Now, literal interpretation of this means that unlawful threats can be administered to the plaintiff himself or to any party. They need not be a pre-existing relationship, be it friendship or family. It then follows then what is the rationale for holding such agreements voidable because the plaintiff is not is not aware of the party being whose 
this unlawful threats are being made to or even care for them and this was certainly the and this was certainly the view that the court in Malaysia took in the case of Wong Ah Folk and the state of Johor. Here, the plaintiff's plea for duress was dismissed on the grounds that the unlawful threats which were being administered were to his customers and he did not know them or care for them. However, Hussein still makes a strong case for duress um, to unknown parties and that is and that is of humanity. And then, and then and he poses the question, are the courts willing to enforce a contract that was brought about as a result of unlawful threats made to a person or even people. The second distinction is that of intention and we, the general rule in, in the English legal system is that is that um, intention does not need to be proved. That once uh, the plaintiff has established that uh, illegit illegitimate pressure has been administered, that is enough for a plea of duress. However, in Malaysia, again, following the literal interpretation of Section 15, requires that um, intention be proved. We we'll now look at the common opposition with, with regard to some aspects of duress. We'll start off with duress to goods. Now, Malaysia expressly recognizes duress to goods. However, until recently, England did not recognize duress to goods. And this is given to us in the case of Skit and Bill. Here, there were two, here, this case raised two conflicting theories. One is that the duress to goods is not enough ground to invalidate a contract. However, if the plaintiff pays to recover this goods, he can later bring an action to recover the amount paid. However, if the defendant can establish that there was enough, um, there was enough consideration, then the plaintiff's claim will be dismissed. Now, clearly, this is a controversial area of the law regarding the fact that the general rule that guides consideration is that consideration needs to be adequate and not sufficient. Thus, it was done away in the case of Universe Center. The second distinction is that of the overborne will theory. Now, Malaysia still adopts this system. However, common law has slowly moved away from this. And Stuart seeks to explain why this shift is justifiable. And he states that the overborne will theory with regards to economic duress is not practical. This is because most commercial agreements do have some element of intense commercial pressure. And therefore, the courts allowing for such a claim for contracts to be reopened on the grounds of um, the plaintiff's will being overborne, uh, the plaintiff's will being overborne simply out of intense commercial pressure is not practical. The next uh, criticism that justifies the need for a change is that where uh, it comes from Chu, and it's that where the traditional approach once again centers, centers on the victim's will and his consent, uh, and his consent not being a true consent, for he's no longer operating as a free agent. However, Chu notes that this is not necessarily true because if this were true, then all then all contracts which were induced by duress would be void and not voidable. And he states that um, certainly the will of the plaintiff has been impaired, but it's not negated. Atia seeks to further elaborate on this by stating that the overborn will theory implies the notion of automatism, where the plaintiff himself has been stripped off of all reasoning or understanding, which, as we've established before, is not true. She, she insists that uh, in fact the plaintiff is aware of all uh, of the current circumstances and is aware of the consequences of choosing whether to consent or not to consent therefore the final consent given is actually a voluntary one and it's a conscious one now another distinction is that of illegitimacy which the common law recognizes and malaysia doesn't now, um, common law states that the general rule is that one will not be liable for duress if the threat made was within one's legal rights. However, the case of the Universe Sentinel seemed to suggest that even lawful threats can be illegitimate. Here, judgment delivered established that the first step in, in determining legitimacy is to look at the nature of the threat, which in most cases is usually sufficient. However, if, um, however, if the threat was lawful, the second step is to look at the nature of the demand that accompanies that threat. And Stuart sheds more light on this by stating that, by stating that technically a threat that is lawful can be considered illegitimate with regard to the demand that accompanies it. The classic example obviously being um, blackmail where most of the time the threats made are lawful ones. 
he states that um, actually lawfulness should not play a role at all with regards to determining illegitimacy because um, a threat made in the commercial world can be as coercive as an unlawful one. The final distinction is that of a causal link. Now, in the common law, um, as by the case established in Barton and Armstrong, it was established that a uh, claim for duress, you need only to show that it was a cause that induced um, the victim to enter into the contract. However, in Malaysia, under Section 14, literal interpretation seems to imply that it needs to be the sole cause. And um, Stuart is in favor of the Malaysian approach, stating that economic duress, with regard to economic duress, stating that if courts were to allow claims, um, commercial claims, simply, simply out of uh, a causal link of being induced into the contract out of commercial pressure, it, the courts would be encroaching too much into the financial world. And he states that um, the rules stated in Barton and Armstrong should be limited to duress to person. Now that you have known about duress and the English law by my colleague Stephanie, now let's criticize the doctrine of duress under the English legal system. It is suggested that duress provide the defense to many crimes except murder. There has been judicial acceptance that threats of immediate death or serious personal injury are sufficient to overwhelm ordinary powers of criminal conduct where the crime comprises, for example, manslaughter, damage to property, and even some forms of treason. The recent formulation of the defense of duress of circumstances has resulted in exclusions for defendants charged with, for instance, again, various road, traffic offenses, and even hijacking. However, the availability of duress as a defense has always been restricted, and in particular, the inapplicability of the defense to a charge of murder has caused much contentions. As suggested by Lord Scarman in the case of Universe Tank Ship 1983, nature of the act or the omission threatened by the Croatia will decide the legitimacy of the pressure. Nevertheless, in some cases, a threat to something cl clearly lawful can make the threat illegal as a result of the circumstances of the demand. Therefore, concentrating on the illegality and legality of the threatened act of omission will form an artificial barrier which produces absurdity. The court should have freedom to accept in appropriate circumstances the legitimacy of Persia regardless of its unlawful nature. The emphasis of the need of, to, to form an illegitimate threat has led us to the conclusion that a threat to break a contract can constitute duress, whereas the refusal to waive an existing contractual obligation cannot. Therefore, by introducing the need for a leg legitimate death threat could be tough to practice in this age. Secondly, one of the most continuous issues is whether or not the party who has extended the pressure was threatening to cancel the contract, or he was entitled to make the demand which he was making in early stage. Thirdly is the fact that duress makes a contract voidable rather than void as the consequence that it is necessary for the party alleging duress to steps to set aside the agreement. Lastly is moreover a failure to take steps against the contract within reasonable time might turn out the agreement is valid and can no longer be set aside. That we had criticized duress under English law, let's criticize the doctrine of duress under the Malaysian legal system itself. Although coercion under the Malaysian law is wider than common law due to the fact that every offense under the penal code can amount to coercion, yet Malaysian law does not cover all the torturous or other civil wrongs covered by the common law, making it a bit narrow at some context. The conflict on economic duress under the Malaysian law is another issue as it's wide and obvious. Economic duress is not explicitly stated in Section 15 of Contract Act of 1950 as the definition of coercion is very limited in that sense. The High Court held that the Contract Act of 1950 does not provide for any form of coercion other than as defined by Section 15 itself. As it was seen in the case of Perilous Plantations, Berhad and Muhammad Abdullah of 1988. And lastly, economic duress is recognized in principle but was not established in cases at all. So now that we had criticized both systems on duress, now let's suggest how to improve those systems. 
Firstly, we will talk about the ways to improve the position of the English legal systems on duress. Due to the ambiguity that exists in some areas of economic duress, in cases of duress to goods, no precise guidelines are exist at all. What can be merely stated is that if a set remedy is to be established by law in relation to the duress of goods, it should be narrow and must be based upon a much more limited basis than the cases which involves the duress of the person. Therefore, it is recommended that a proper authority should be developed to decide what kind of instances would provide the basis depending on which law would provide the remedy. Another major difficulty to exist is and this area is lack of awareness among laymen with regard to these fundamental concepts of law of contract. One may enter into a contract following duress and not be aware of the remedies the law can provide. Therefore, it's recommended that these standards promote contractual free will and principles governing this common law concept should be enriched in, in, in courts of business and ethics as well. Secondly is the way our suggestion to improve the Malaysian legal systems on duress. All the duress under the Malaysian legal system is covered by all the crimes seen in the penal code, yet it fails to consider many other offenses outside the penal code as well as torturous or other civil wrongs which are covered by the common law already. Therefore, the Contract Act of 1950 should be wider in that concern than its it is by including the offenses which are already dealt with in the common law system. Section 15 of the Contract Act of 1990 does not mention economic duress at all, making it harder for the courts to cite such cases as see, seen in, again, Perilous Plantations, Birhad and Muhammad Abdullah Eng of 1988. However, in some later cases, the court had recognized economic duress, but yet the Contract Act of 1950 fails to do so. So it would be better, even more liable for the courts, uh, to, uh, for the courts if the Contract Act of 1950 to be am amended and include the doctrine of economic duress to it. So with this, we come to an end to our presentation, and now with our opinion to be said by my colleague. Muhammad is that. In our opinion, after analyzing everything critically, in common law, the duress of uh, the basis of duress as a vitiating factor in contract law is that there is an absence of free consent. Duress in English law is a complete law, uh, common law defense, operating in favor of those who committed the tort because they are uh, forced or compelled to do so. Now, in Malaysia, under Section 15, there is a clear, broader, uh, broader. Uh, compass than the common law when it comes to cases related to property as it expressly recognizes the rest of goods where, common, where the common law fails to do so. However, it will be more reliable for the courts if the Contracts Act of 1950 expressly states economic duress. In a nutshell, it is clear that the English legal system is much better than the Malaysian legal system because it is much more detailed on the doctrine of duress. However, things may change in the future as, as uh, compared to the English uh, legal system, the Malaysian legal system is still considered in its infancy. Things may change or may improve in the future. With this, we have come uh, to a conclusion on our video presentation.